In this video, we'll be debunking the body type myth. Let's get to it. There are still many forums, websites, and even fitness instructors who use the convenience of the endo, meso, ecto classification for body types, perpetuating a myth that has no foundation in science. Our bodies are the instruments we use to connect to the world and the places we all live in. So it's worth taking a little time to unpack this a little and understand where the myth ends and where the science begins. The theory behind body types came in the 1940s from the American psychologist, notice I didn't say physiologist, I said psychologist, William Herbert Sheldon who used visual examination to classify the human physique according to the relative contribution of three fundamental elements named after the three germ layers of embryonic development. The endoderm develops into the digestive tract. The mesoderm becomes muscle, heart, and blood vessels, and the ectoderm forms the skin and the nervous system. In the 1940s, there was a strong social movement in the U.S. that leaned towards eugenics and Sheldon's endo, mecto, ecto classification fed directly and very conveniently into that. Despite the physical aspect of Sheldon's theory, his real aim was to tie his observations into psychological observations about the psychological makeup of people and associate that with each body type, creating the theory of constitutional psychology. Sheldon used subjective classification techniques based upon his visual appraisal of subjects' physiques. His theory has since been discredited. Unfortunately, the fallacy of physical classifications persists to this day, and it's a very poor way of looking at how the human body works or how it can put on muscle. The reason the fallacy persists to this day is because his research assistants, Barbara Heath and later Lindsay Carter, developed it further and popularized it in the 1960s, creating a convenient way for many fitness professionals to work with it. Since our knowledge of how the body works has developed incredibly since the 1960s, it's time we started to retire the endo meso ecto classification for the myth that it is. First of all, there is no single person who is adequately described by one of these classifications, which means that at best, they're an approximation and at worst, flat out wrong. And you don't want to base your training and nutrition on something that is almost right. Second, each person's body is the result of a mix of characteristics that are traditionally ascribed to one of the Heath Carter body types. So in reality, the visual elements that make a person fit into one or the other are actually wrong and likely to lead to more problems than solutions. Here are four key things to remember. Number one, every person is a combination of all three body types based upon the complexities of their anthropomorphic makeup. Someone can be tall, heavy, and still relatively lightly muscled for their size. Someone else could be short, light, yet heavily muscled. You can't base any training or nutrition plan just on the visual aspect of how you look or how heavy you are, case in point, Bruce Lee, who built himself up with a proper training and nutrition program. Number two, physical performance has nothing to do with body types and everything to do with physical strength, endurance, coordination, and the ability of the body to successfully coordinate muscle groups during ballistic exertion involving concentric and eccentric muscle movements. Case in point, martial artist Sammo Hung. Number three, physical fitness is independent of body type. It refers to the ability of muscles to do specific work within a certain context and recover in a sufficiently short space of time to do it all over again. Consider that both a heavyweight boxer and a marathon runner are very fit, but visually look very different. 
And number four, the popular link between body type and metabolism is false. While there are differences in the base metabolic rate, which measures the amount of calories a body burns at rest for each body type, they are a result of muscles and musculature and the individual level of activity that each person engages in rather than the body type itself. So what determines how you put on muscle? The question then remains, if body type is not really indicative of how easily or quickly we can put on muscle, what is? Muscle only grows as strong and powerful as the anchoring points allow them to, and those anchoring points are tendons and bones. Strong tendons and strong bones make for strong, powerful muscles. Because bones and tendons get stronger through physical activity, which exercises the muscles, this is a little bit of a catch-22. At this point, nutrition comes in. Bones require calcium, and calcium has to be present in the diet. A combination of enough calcium and sufficient high-impact exercise to frequently generate G-forces begins to affect the density of the bones. As bones get denser, they can support greater exertion from the muscles more easily. So muscles can now begin to grow faster. The recipe for building muscles has always been the same for everyone. First, there's good nutrition. Then there's regular exercise that challenges the muscle groups you want to get stronger. And finally, sufficient sleep for the body to restore muscle fiber damage and build new muscle. People with bones that are already dense because of their lifestyle will find it easier to put on muscle. And women, whose bones are generally not as dense as men's, will have to work a lot harder to see results. How much each person burns at their base metabolic rate will depend on their weight, muscle to fat ratio, physical and mental activity levels, their height, and the type of foods they generally eat. This means with the proper combination of training and nutrition, anyone can put on muscle regardless of their size, but not everyone can put on the same amount of muscle at the same speed. The formula for losing or gaining weight is the same for everyone regardless. Eat more than you burn to put weight on and eat less than you burn to lose weight. You can't escape basic science. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up and click on this thumbnail to discover 10 foods that are good for diabetes. That's it. That's all. See you next time.